let me shut okay. up and introduce um hand over to to Jinder, who who is going to introduce, to introduce our speaker today uh nicole furry um if i could okay. just say uh that, of course the almost the the principal reason we're here and that this entire seminar series is taking place is, is because it has been inspired to a great extent by the program which uh with which uh, Nicole is uh, is is herself and you know, so now closely identified. Um, so I'm going to hand over to to Jinder, who who will have quite a bit more to say. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. I couldn't agree with you more about what you said just now about Cole. So it's my pleasure to welcome Cole Fury to give today's lecture on octonions and particle physics. Cole obtained a PhD from Perimeter in 2015 and her thesis titled Standard Model Physics from an Algebra is one of the best known PhD thesis in high energy theoretical physics in recent times. This thesis left a mark on studies of octonions in particle physics to the extent that her name has almost become synonymous with the subject. A 14 part set of video lectures on division algebras and the standard model is a must see for anyone interested in getting into the subject. For me, her most significant work is charge quantization from a number operator, where the properties of one generation of standard model fermions are convincingly derived from a Clifford algebra motivated from the complex octonions. I also have an interesting personal story to tell. I first heard of octonions only three years back when my own work indicated that eight dimensional spaces could be significant for unification. However, I had never heard of such a space. So I Googled the term eight dimensional spaces. Google returned a quantum magazine article on coal and her work on the octonions. And within minutes of reading it, I knew this to be what I was looking for. That same evening I wrote to her and she was kind enough to immediately send back an encouraging reply. Since then, it has been octonions all the way, and none of it would have been possible without the groundwork done by her. So thank you, Cole, and over to you for this exciting lecture. Thank you so much to, to Ginger. That was um, yeah, yeah, extremely kind. Um, it, thank you. OK, um, so. First of all, I want to uh, say th thank you sincerely to both to Ginger and to Michael uh, for organizing this lecture series. Um, you know, these things, of course, take a lot of work, and I hope that you know that many of us are really grateful to you for putting it together. Um, the atmosphere uh, so far has been really positive, and uh, many of us really appreciate that. Um, and before I start, um, I would like to mention that many of the results I'm going to be discussing today were done in collaboration with two people, namely Beth Romano, who is a number theorist at King's College London, and for earlier work, Mia Hughes, uh, who completed her PhD on supergravity um, at Imperial College London. Um, now, in this talk, I'm going to be discussing some work on three generations, um, especially later on in the talk. And um, we're, of course, not the only ones to be working on this problem. Um, there's, of course, uh, Corinne Minogue, Teviendre, and Robert Wilson, who have um, an E8 three-generation model. There's David Chester, Mike Rios, and collaborators who've been working on a three-generation, on who've been working on three-generation E8 models. Niels uh, Gresnik and Adam Gillard have worked on three generations and complex seal eight. Tejinder Singh and his group, who have worked on E8 and, exception, and the exceptional Jordan algebra, Ivan Todorov, Michel Dubois-Violette, who've worked on the exceptional Jordan algebra, Latham Boyle, who's worked on the exceptional Jordan algebra, David Jackson, who I believe has also done uh, worked with three generations in uh, the exceptional Jordan algebra. Um, and uh, now that I've got this list down, I think um, also uh, Greg Trailing, uh, I um, should have also included. Um, and I'm certainly, um, forgetting people on this list uh, unintentionally. Um, but the, the point is that there's uh, quite a number of us now that are uh, working on this, uh, this challenge. Okay. So with this said, as theorists, every once in a while, it's good to take a step back and ask, what is my best guess to the following question? That is, what is the universe made of and how does it work? What is my best guess? That is, imagine that tomorrow that our game of building theories would for some reason be over. 
or imagine that our profession were soon to be overtaken by some accelerating self-improving artificial intelligence. If you were asked to lay your cards on the table, what would be your best, what would your best guess be? Well, this is of course a difficult question to answer since um, you know, we're always working with incomplete information. Nonetheless, in this talk, I would like to offer for you what is my current best guess. And I'm gonna run you through the logic right from the very beginning. So every research project starts out with some sort of intuition or some picture of what nature is at its essence. For example, in quantum field theory, we have a picture of particles on a space-time where the particles are described by excitations on a, on a, of a um, field living on a manifold. Physical theories, of course, begin with some initial input or some initial structures that are meant to make up reality. Of course, these structures should be chosen very carefully, seeing as how one wrong assumption may lead your theory to shipwreck. That is, every extra structure carries with it a risk of being wrong. Now, our current best model of particle physics is known as the standard model. Um, on one hand, the standard model works better than any previous particle model that we've had in making uh, predictions in particle physics. On the other hand, it leaves many basic questions answered. For example, why is it rooted in the gauge group SU3 cross SU2 cross U1 over Z6 and not some other group? Why do we have the space-time symmetries that we do? And even if we were to understand where these symmetries came from, we would still be unable to explain why the standard model has this long and apparently senseless list of, of fundamental particles. Furthermore, it doesn't answer what makes up dark matter, dark energy believed to comprise 95% of the mass energy content of the universe. And this isn't even an exhaustive list of open questions. So one might wonder if perhaps we have been making some assumptions or there, there have been some assumptions made in our construction of the standard model that could be preventing it from accessing a more complete description of nature. Now, as you know, the standard model has quite a lengthy list of initial inputs. We begin with the three plus one dimensional space-time manifold. A manifold in and of itself has non-trivial structure. We then add in a Fox space, matter fields, gauge fields, Higgs fields. We impose the quantization procedure, et cetera. Now, given that every extra structure brings with it a risk of being wrong, we might instead opt to minimize our initial inputs. That is, we will seek to minimize our initial inputs for practical reasons, because this is the most cautious way to proceed. Now, another reason that we might consider aiming for a minimalistic theory is for reasons of beauty. So it's my personal opinion that mathematical elegance is a valid guide in model building. But the question is then, well, who gets to decide what elegance is? My personal take is that a more beautiful theory is one that compresses the physical data more efficiently. So in the case of the standard model, we have described aspects of a very complex natural world by using a very complex theory. And what would be more beautiful in my mind is a minimalistic set of initial inputs that could still output the same predictions. So we could take the game of Go as an analogy. Go has a set of rules that are simple enough to teach a child, but the resulting scenarios are complex enough that adults can spend their lives studying them. Now, building a successful minimalistic model presents uh, for us a bigger challenge for a couple of reasons. The first reason is that your theory now has a lot more work to do in terms of creating something complex out of something simple. It's also more challenging for sociological reasons. That is, nobody's colleagues are impressed by simple machines. So at the end of my undergrad and throughout my master's, I began playing a bit of a game. Now here's the game. The game is to answer what could be the smallest set of initial inputs to start with, whereby you still capture as many known features of nature as possible. For example, you might want to capture the irreversibility of time or the existence of matter and its interactions or the existence or emergence of space-time, the three plus one dimensionality of space-time, quantum locality or entropy increase, et cetera. So a big dream 
would be to would be something along the lines of starting with some minimal inputs and arriving at say standard model scattering amplitudes. As a side note, I wanna point out that we physicists often make the mistake that mathematicians know not to make. That is, once we have one established theory um, that can make predictions, like the standard model in the form of the QFT, we often assume that it is unique. That it's the only story that is gonna produce for us the answers that we need. Or in other words, we conflate existence with uniqueness. The standard model is a machine that amongst other things spits out probabilities. A probability is just a real number between zero and one. But there could conceivably exist a much simpler model that could spit out the same probabilities. Now, as a first attempt at this problem, I wanted to aim for something that does away with the hierarchical system um, that we assume in QFT. That is where we have various fields living on top of the space-time manifold. So one picture that I proposed along these lines is based solely on directed graphs. So clearly this resembles Feynman graphs, except for the fact that it is not embedded in a separate background space-time. Instead, these directed graphs would be the only objects in the model. So everything that we perceive as matter, its interactions, um, the apparent space-time in which it would live would ultimately have to come from only these directed graphs. This was an idea that I proposed in my part three research essay in 2006. Um, later, I included it in the first chapter of my PhD thesis. At the time, I received a significant amount of pushback for this idea. Um, there was a very small number of us at the time that quite literally risked our careers in order to put these ideas forward. One example I'm aware of comes from Fotini Marco Polo and David Cribbs, who suggested that the world should be constructed using quantum information processing systems, again, with no notion of a separate underlying space-time. In more recent times, these sorts of ideas have gained Mainstream, uh, mainstream acceptance um, with similar standalone graph models being proposed by established professors. So this was the first round of this minimalistic model building game. However, you can see that we already run into a problem, which incidentally the standard model also faces. That is, as with the standard model, there's no obvious explanation as to why space-time appears to be three plus one dimensional. So how might we face up to this problem? So this is where we might very cautiously add in more structure. Namely, we're going to add in the structure of an algebra. And the idea is that if these directed graphs were in fact representing the operations of an algebra, then maybe we could use the properties of this algebra in order to give the dimension of what we eventually see as an emergent space-time. Okay, well then which algebra do you choose? As a first example, you could consider the algebra of the quaternions, um, which has this, because it's got this suggestive structure, it's got one real dimension and three imaginary dimensions. Um, now, as I mentioned, uh, early on in my part three essay, the basic notion would then be of uh, graphs of quaternionic triads, like quaternionic field binds, branching out over and over and over again, um, and sometimes also doing the reverse process, um, where, where they join edges together at a vertex. Now, this branching is supposed to give general phenomena, such as things like entropy increase and the universe's expansion, and joining of edges at a vertex, on the other hand, is meant to ultimately give us phenomena such as gravity, interactions in what we eventually might come to know as measurement. And now notice that these quaternionic triads bear a striking resemblance to the field binds of general relativity. Um, and we're gonna get back to this later. Now, any physicist who has worked with the quaternions know that they almost give you the physics that you want, but not quite. That is the inner automorphisms of the, of the quaternions give us SO3, not the Lorentz group. Um, but it turns out that if you tweak this slightly, then several doors open up. 
That is, in physics, we've got these familiar two by two Hermitian matrices known as the Pauli matrices. And uh, there's this well known correspondence between sigma x and i sig epsilon one, sigma y and i epsilon two, sigma z and i epsilon three, where i is the complex imaginary unit and epsilon one, two, three are quaternionic imaginary units. Now, furthermore, it's a well known fact that there is an isomorphism uh, between the two by two um, complex matrices and the quaternions now with complex coefficients. So not only can we get these quickly relevant Pauli matrices from the complex quaternions, but we can furthermore get the Lorentz group. That is the group of inner automorphisms of the complex quaternions is given by none other than SO31. Now it turns out that there's this old paper uh, from the 1930s by A.W. Conway, which shows that you can describe Dirac spinners, four vectors, the field string tensor, using nothing more than the complex quaternions. As you may recognize, this, already, this is already most of the Lorentz representations that we use today in the standard model. Okay, so this is hopeful. Um, and what I want to show you now, number one, is that there is in fact a bigger picture behind Conway's findings having to do with discrete symmetries. This bigger picture will allow us to get a complete set of the standard models uh, representations. This involves the inclusion of scalars and the selection of Majorana spinner representations over Dirac. And finally, um, there, uh, this bigger picture will allow us, will lead us to an idea um, that might help us address the following question. That is, if all we have is this algebra, these algebraic graphs, then how are things like field string tensors and spinners supposed to pop out or emerge? So let's talk about this last point first. So if all we have is an algebra, then how are things like field string ten tensors and spinners supposed to pop out? Now, a bigger picture behind Conway's findings that I was referring to uh, refers to the idea of an ideal. So let's say we have some algebra um, in this case, given by the complex quaternions. Then a left ideal is a special subalgebra, whereby if you were to left multiply any element A in the algebra onto an element V in the ideal, then their product V prime will always get pulled back inside the ideal. So loosely speaking, you can think of ideals as an algebra's version of a black hole in that it will pull any element into itself via multiplication. Uh, so these ideals, um, you could think of them as the stable subspaces of the algebra. So now what we're going to find shortly is that each of the Lorentz representations of the standard model can be identified as objects that generalize the notion of an ideal. So in this sense, the scalars, the spinners, the four vectors, the field string tensor can be seen to be stable subspaces of the algebra. For mathematicians, these are known as invariant subspaces under some action of the algebra on itself. Um, so the idea I propose in my thesis is very much in, uh, in the flavor of Darwin's mechanism of uh, survival of the fittest. Uh, the fact that ideals are stable under multiplication could be viewed as them surviving over time. Now you notice that, this example, that in this example, we assumed that the multiplication rule is left multiplication, but we could just as, as well have assumed right multiplication or perhaps something more general such as an adjoint action. So what I'm about to show you is that the scalars, spinners, four vectors, and field string tensor, the various Lorentz representations of the standard model, can each be thought of as generalizations of ideals under different multiplication rules. Um, a more precise way to say this is that each of the Lorentz representations of the standard model can be shown to be invariant subspaces of the complex quaternions under some action of the algebra on itself. So this next part is important. Okay, um, the next part is important because we're going to use some of the details in the in the later parts of the talk. Okay, so the complex quaternions have these three discrete symmetries. We've got the complex conjugate, which maps complex i to minus i. We've got the quaternionic conjugate, which takes quaternionic um, epsilon one, two, and three to minus epsilon one, two, and three, and it also reverses the order of multiplication. And finally, we've got what we call the Hermitian conjugate, 
which does both the complex conjugate and the quaternionic conjugate at the same time. Now, under each of these discrete symmetries, the complex quaternions split into two pieces. For example, starting on the left-hand side, we get one piece, which is invariant under the complex conjugate. Um, and the other piece picks up a negative sign under the complex conjugate. And the same goes for the, hermi for the hermitian conjugate. One piece is gonna be hermitian and the other one's gonna be anti-hermitian. And the same is true for the quaternionic conjugate. There's one piece that picks up a plus sign and the other one picks up a minus sign. Now, based on these discrete symmetries, we can now define actions of the algebra on itself, or in other words, generalized multiplication rules. So these actions are chosen so that, for example, an object that starts out Hermitian will continue to, to be Hermitian no matter which A in the algebra that you apply to it. And the same goes for the anti-Hermitian piece. So any A that you apply onto it, if it starts out anti-Hermitian, it will end up anti-Hermitian again. Um, so this is the multiplication rule, um, or more precisely, the action um, that we use for the Hermitian conjugate. Um, and then uh, there's also a similar action for the quaternionic conjugate that looks like this. You'll notice that the two, uh, they, they look similar to each other. It's because um, the um, Hermitian conjugate and the quaternionic conjugate are both anti-automorphisms. Um, now for the complex conjugate, on the other hand, here's what the, here's what the action looks like. Um, the P here is uh, nothing more than a chirality projector. So under each of these actions, every one of these subspaces listed here is stable. Um, now, finally, we need to identify what these stable subspaces are gonna represent for us. Um, you can probably already guess. Um, now, suppose we take some element A, um, A to be an element of the group SL2C, uh, written, of course, in the language of complex quaternions. Um, then based on the specific way that these subspaces transform, these two subspaces on the left-hand side can each be identified as a Majorana spinner. The two subspaces in the center can each be identified as four vectors. And the two subspaces on the right-hand side can be identified as a complex scalar and a six real dimensional field string tensor. So finally, there is a uh, Another feature that is going to come up again later, and that's that in the case of these two anti-automorphisms, C cross H gets broken down into a Jordan algebra and a Lie algebra. So here the Hermitian subspace gives a Jordan algebra and the anti-Hermitian subspace gives a Lie algebra. And the same goes for the quaternionic conjugate. Um, here the scalar um, gives a Jordan algebra and the field string tensor gives a Lie algebra. Okay, so let's take stock now where we've come so far with this model. So we started out uh, with the minimalistic input that nature is made of nothing more than directed graphs. Then we noticed that a generic directed graph um, is not going to lead to the emergence of a three plus one dimensional space time. So from here, we propose considering that these directed graphs represent the operations of an algebra. Now, which algebra should we choose? We found that the algebra of the complex quaternions can give us quite a bit of mileage. That is, we found that the discrete symmetries of the complex quaternions provide us with an exquisitely compressed uh, way to describe scalar spinners, four vectors in the field string tensor. And this gives us the complete set of Lorentz representations that we use in the standard model. Um, now I wanna emphasize that the, the system of Lorentz representations is in many ways the poster child for what a minimalistic model should look like. Um, what we're going to do for the rest of this talk is demonstrate a way to take this system and to scale it up. Okay, so how are we gonna do this? Well, the particles of the standard model have more properties uh, beyond just their behavior under Lorentz transformations. They of course have color, weak isospin, weak hypercharge, for example. Um, so is there a way that we could also model these extra degrees of freedom? Well, let's take a closer look at this algebra that we're using. The complex quaternions are given by C cross H, where the tensor product is over R. And it's straightforward to see that this C cross H is trivially equal to R cross C cross H, where the R is the real numbers. And at this point, you might also notice that this algebra is the tensor product of three out of four of the finite dimensional norm division algebras over R. 
So it's then natural to wonder, well, you know, what if we were to include the final norm division algebra, the octonions? Could the combined algebra, RCHO, then allow us to include the remaining internal degrees of freedom? Well, this question becomes um, even more unavoidable when you notice that the number of internal states in one generation adds up to eight. That is a neutrino, red, green, and blue down type quarks, red, green, and blue up type quarks, and a charged lepton. Now, there are examples of earlier researchers who have noticed similar patterns. Uh, namely, in the 1970s, Gunaydin and Gersey identified quark anti a quark-antiquark -quark pair under SU3 within the octonions. And as for the full RCHO algebra back in the 1990s, Jeffrey Dixon proposed a series of particle models based on the algebra of two by two matrices over RCHO. Now, RCHO makes up the components of this algebra, so it's why we often refer to RCHO as the Dixon algebra. Jeffrey is the first person I know to have had an algebra named after him. Um, now I should point out that Murat Gunaydin as a student, Jeffrey Dixon and a number of us attending this conference have had to weather a lot of pushback um, for coming forward with these ideas on the octonions. Well, this for me is a really curious state of affairs. The octonions are just a mathematical object, just like any other object, just like any other mathematical object. Um, so having a prejudiced against having a prejudice against the octonions makes about as much sense to me as having a prejudice against number seven. A recurring theme in my talk um, will be recurring themes. So since we're here, why don't we linger on this point a little? On a somewhat related note, I want to mention that over recent years, there have been more established physicists working on the octonions than there were before. So to these mathematical physicists, I would like to say, welcome. It's nice to have you here. Secondly, to these established professors, I would also like to remind you that, that um, there have been many researchers working on octonions long before you got here. Many of those researchers who are here tonight or who might be listening to this later, risked their careers in order to work on this topic. Some of them have even been unable to continue in academia because of that choice. So with this said, I would like to encourage you to be as inclusive as possible with the, these researchers when you write your papers and you tell your story. This goes especially in the case um, where you've made use of the work of these earlier researchers. Um, because many of these physicists have taken a risk and have paid a price that you have not. Okay. So we're now at the point uh, where we have now upgraded our algebra uh, to RCHO, a 32 complex dimensional algebra. And we would like to eventually calculate standard model scattering amplitudes. So our first step then is to try to model the full particle content of the standard model, much in the way that we modeled Lorentz scalars, spinners, four vectors in the field string tensor using the complex quaternions. Okay, so what's the standard model's particle content? Well, as you know, the standard model's gauge group is SU3 cross SU2 cross U1 over Z6. And under this group, the standard model has this very long and seemingly arbitrary list of irreducible representations. The first entry in, here in the brackets refers to the irrep under SU3 color. The second refers to the irrep under SU2 left. And the third refers to weak hypercharge. And the subscript at the end refers to uh, the multiplicity of these off-shell states. Now, if we add up all the degrees of freedom in this list, taking every particle as off-shell, counting the Higgs as its own independent space, and finally including an additional set of three sterile neutrinos, then we have 244 real degrees of freedom in total. So roughly 250, which is quite a lot. Well, let's check back at this RCHO algebra that we're interested in. How big is it? It's 64 real dimensions. So it seems like we might be stuck. How are we going to model 250, roughly 250 real degrees of, um, real off-shell degrees of freedom of the standard model when all that we have to work with is a 64 real dimensional algebra? Well, one idea is to take a hint from nature. Nature succeeds in, in describing the entire human genome using only four bases, A, C, T, and G. Well, how does it accomplish this? Nature accomplishes this not by considering those four bases alone, but instead by considering sequences of the bases. 
So let's see what would happen if we were to consider sequences of RCHO elements, one being multiplied onto another. Might we be able to describe the fermions and bosons of the standard model inside these sequences? Now, sequentially multiplying RCHO elements onto RCHO elements generates something fam um, familiar to mathematicians known as its multiplication algebra. You can think of RCHO's full multiplication algebra as being isomorphic as a matrix algebra to the 32 by 32 complex matrices or to the complex Clifford algebra CL10. Um, it's generated um, by using 10 objects, uh, which we're going to call gamma J. And you can think of these 10 gammas as being like the four A, C, T, and G bases of genetic sequences. So these 10 gammas generate the complex Clifford algebra CL10. Um, so this is CL10, but CL10 with a lot of extra structure due to the fact that it's uh, generated by RCHNO. Um, and this, um, extra, this extra structure will then give us a number of ways that we can break CL10 up. Okay, so, so we're considering these sequences of RCHO elements and it generates the CL10, but it's not just CL10, it's CL10 with extra structure. And we're gonna use this extra division algebraic substructure to break CL10 up. Now it turns out that we can write RCHO's full multiplication algebra as a factorization um, that is interesting on mathematical grounds. That is, we can split up complex CL10 as the real CL08, familiar from the bot periodicity on real Clifford algebras, and uh, complex CL2, familiar from bot periodicity of complex Clifford algebras. Um, this might relate to what John Bias and others call the tenfold way. As a physical interpretation, I would like to identify the standard model's off-shell states with CL08. And then there's going to be this CL2 factor that's left over. Now, given the isomorphism between complex CL2 and the real CL30, we might be able to adopt an interpretation of this CL30 part that um, yeah, so that the CL30 part represents the rudimentary algebraic beginnings of a three-dimensional space, and um, that is three legs of some evolving triad. From here, we might try to incorporate gravity. So in geometric terms, the setup could give us the algebraic beginnings of an, 11, an emergent 11-dimensional 11 space where we find ourselves with a three-dimensional spatial uh, base manifold and a fiber producing standard model degrees of freedom. Now CL08 in and of itself is an algebra worth paying attention to for a number of reasons. Number one, it is roughly the right number of degrees of freedom of the standard model's off-shell states. So CL08, um, we're looking for about 250 real degrees of freedom and CL08 is 256 real. Number two, in the world of real Clifford algebras, CL08 is essentially unavoidable. Well, what do I mean by unavoidable? So let's say that you were to consider the space of all real Clifford algebras in the form of CLST. Here, the S and the T can be any integers greater than or equal to zero. So there's an infinite number of these Clifford algebras. Then Bach periodicity tells us that if you were to choose one of the, these CLSTs at random out of this infinite set, then with overwhelming probability, the Clifford algebra will be of this form. That is CLS0, T0, cross CL8, cross CL8, cross CL8, cross CL8, over and over again, where the S0 and T0 uh, live within zero to seven inclusive. So in other words, it will have this little end piece, C0, CL, S0, T0, followed by this long string of CL8, cross CL8, cross CL8, CL8, and so on. So it's gonna be overwhelmingly dominated by factors of CL8. So it's in this sense that I mean to say that CL8 is unavoidable. Um, so this touches on a point that I'd like to make um, about which mathematical structures we choose when we're building physical theories. That is, when a theorist is building um, a physical model, they could choose the prints of mathematical structures. That is, they could look for a mathematical structure that is somehow the most distinguished or the most special. 
Or alternatively, we might opt instead for a mathematical structure that is the most common. CL8 is an example of a mathematical structure that is the most common, at least within the space of real Clifford algebras. So we could say that CL8 is special because it is not special. Now, third reason why I find CL08 interesting is because it looks, loosely speaking, like we might be able, it might give us a natural incarnation of a Fox space. So let's say we can indeed describe a state in the standard model as an element of CL08. And this is what we're going to argue shortly. Then this would count as a one particle state. And let's say now that we were to take some Clifford algebra, CLST, at random. Then an element in this space might be viewed as a multiparticle state. And here the number of particles in the multiparticle state would correspond to the number of factors of CL08 that the Clifford algebra has. Then finally, taking superpositions over different size Clifford algebras could give us something along the lines of a bot periodic Fox space. That is, we'll start with a zero particle state, then we add in a one particle state, the two particle state, and so on. We might even include the, to the totality of all real Clifford algebras by summing over all possible S and Ts. Now, as a final note, um, I should mention that it may be useful at some point to also consider graded tensor products um, in that these might help us tease out um, fermionic and bosonic behavior. Um, so to the best of my knowledge, uh, this idea of a bot periodic Fox space was first introduced here. Okay, so let's retrace our trajectory. We started out by arguing that the safest possible theory is one that makes the fewest number of assumptions possible. We then propose one such model built from only directed graphs, directed algebraic graphs. Um, that is, we do away with any additional notion of an underlying space time. Now, when that algebra is chosen to be the complex quaternions, <clears throat> then we find that we can describe all of the Lorentz representations of the standard model in a concise way. Well, these Lorentz representations are defined by their behavior under discrete symmetries. And now we want to scale this up. So when counting all of the off-shell degrees of freedom in the standard model, we find that we need a space that is roughly 250 real degrees of freedom. As it turns out, uh, we find a relevant 256 real dimensional space by taking a certain real slice of RCHO's multiplication algebra. This CL08 slice is especially interesting for us because it is ubiquitous in the world of real algebras. Furthermore, it might just supply us with a natural incarnation of a Fox space. So now we're at the point of describing how standard model degrees of freedom can be embedded inside of this CL08. Um, so for practical reasons, we're going to do this by first analyzing its structure as a, at the complexified CL8 level, and then we're going to restrict down to the real slice. Now it's crucial to note um, that we're not dealing simply with CL8, but rather CL8 generated by the division algebras RCH and O. So we're, we're in fact gonna have um, a lot of additional substructure here within these algebras. And this is what's gonna help us break the algebra down. So in our first step, um, we're going to bring to light some important substructure that comes about from the octonions. So as many people here will know, the left multiplication algebra of the octonions is given by CL06. And furthermore, you may know that it is possible to describe the volume element of this Clifford algebra as a single octonionic imaginary unit. So for concreteness, we're going to call this imaginary unit E7. Um, but of course, there's an entire six sphere of candidates that we could choose for this imaginary unit. So this octonionic substructure is going to uh, single out for us a volume element expressed in terms of an octonionic imaginary unit. Now with this octonionic imaginary unit E7, we can construct projection operators, um, which we're gonna call little s and little s star. 
Now, these projection operators uh, may be viewed as generalizations of a chirality projector um, that is going to be that's familiar to you from the Dirac algebra. Now, the octonions have this peculiar property that any octonion multiplying from the right can always be rewritten as chains of octonions multiplying from the left. And so this means that the same octonionic imaginary unit E7 will give us a second pair of um, projection operators, namely that which we're going to call capital S and capital S star. So here, the, the capital R here refers to right multiplication. So this octonionic substructure um, of our complex CL8 is going to give us two sets of commuting projection operators. And so the question is now, well, what are these octonionic projectors going to do for us? Well, they're going to take our complex CL8 and they're going to partition it into blocks. Now, there's one curious feature about these blocks. Um, you'll notice that these blocks are of um, various different sizes. The thing that's curious is that um, these sizes happen to fit the standard model's particle representations rather closely. Incidentally, this partitioning is an example of what's known as a purse decomposition um, and is detailed, uh, discussed in detail towards the end of this talk um, linked here. The purse idempotents correspond to projective measurements in quantum theory. So here is the particle content from the standard model that we would like to describe on the left. And it might seem like a small miracle if these representations on the left were to fit tightly into the blocks on the right hand side. After all, these blocks sprang up from just a single octonionic imaginary unit. So you might actually appreciate that we're actually asking for three small miracles. First of all, that the division algebras, uh, this division algebraic substructure of, of our CL8 is going to somehow single out the symmetries that we see in particle physics. Secondly, we need these particle representations to fit tightly into the blocks. And finally, uh, you may notice that there are 23 irreducible representations here on the left-hand side. Um, and it would not be very convincing if each of their transformation rules needed to be specified individually as we do in the standard model. Instead, what would be much more convincing is if uh, we had a relatively simple uh, transformation rule that describes how each of these representations transform. That's our wish list, and let's see how far we get. Um, so let's start by seeing how these octonionic substructure might single out some symmetries for us. Now, a natural expectation is that our symmetries are going to respect um, these octonionic projection operators. So we expect that the symmetries are going to commute with the projectors. This then restricts the symmetry generators and our eventual covariant derivatives um, to live in the diagonal blocks. Now let's consider a linearization um, of the Hermitian action familiar from the beginning of this talk. So just as we had earlier in the C cross H algebra, we find that the block splits into two parts, um, one being, um, her, uh, one, where did this go? Um, it's gonna split into two parts. Uh, one part is gonna be anti-Hermitian and we'll give a Lie algebra. And um, the other part is gonna be Hermitian and it's gonna give a Jordan algebra. So this means that each of these blocks um, is going to be partitioned into a Lie algebra and a Jordan algebra. Um, now the elements in the diagonals should correspond to a covariant derivative um, in our model once Oh, first I need to say, so these, uh, now these Lie algebras um, that we just described um, will give, give us a set of symmetries that we can consider. So the Lie algebras that we find in these blocks are four real dimensional, 36 real dimensional, 36 real dimensional again, and four real dimensional. And the Jordan algebras in these blocks are gonna be the same size as those Lie algebras. Okay, so now 
the elements in the diagonal should correspond to a covariant derivative in our model. Um, once a real slice is taken and um, once it's made into a gauge theory. Um, so that is the pieces that we, the pieces that correspond physically to momentum operators and the pieces that we have, um, we have pieces that correspond to off shell gauge bosons, including their polarizations. Um, we furthermore notice that color, the color and generation parts of these Lie algebras are described by the octonions, um, while helicity and isospin um, are described by the quaternions. Now, these Lie algebras and Jordan, Jordan algebras are physically significant because um, of their expected correspondence to this covariant derivative, but they do not match the symmetries of the standard model gauge group. As you can see that we have too many symmetries here. Um, in fact, some of, uh, some of them are maybe viewed as symmetries that rotate um, octonions into quaternions and quaternions into octonions within these blocks. But we would like our symmetries to respect this division algebraic substructure, so let us restrict down um, ourselves down to the Lie subalgebra. Um, uh, at least subalgebra that forbids these uh, transitions between quaternions and octonions. When we do this, we find that we get two copies of SU3 plus U2 plus U2. Now note that this result comes from the complex CL8 case. When we take the real slice and we're going to lose half of our degrees of freedom. Now you may have noticed that there's a kind of mirror pairing between the algebras um, where there's this reflection symmetry that occurs across this purple axis. So this leads to something that we're gonna call multiplet mirroring. In the complexified case, uh, for every symmetry element on uh, one side of this mirror, um, there's going to be another independent symmetry on the other side. Furthermore, we expect that when these blocks are applied to the fermion off diagonals, uh, one set is going to act on the left-hand side and the, other si and the other one is going to act on the right-hand side of the fermion. Well, what does this multiplet mirror, this multiplet mirroring, um, what is it going to mean physically? Well, physically, we, we find that the um, octonionic SU3 symmetries, when they act on one side of a fermion, um, they mix possible color degrees of freedom. And when the mirror set of octonionic SU3 symmetries act on the other side, then they mix possible generations. Similarly, we find that when certain quaternionic SU2 symmetries act on one side of a fermion, then they mix possible quark helicities. And when the mirror set of quaternionic SU2 symmetries act from the other side, then they mix possible isospin states on left-handed particles. Finally, we find that, um, that when the other set of quaternionic SU2 symmetries act on one side of a fermion, then they mix possible lepton helicities. And when the analog set of quaternionic SU2 symmetries act on the right-hand side, then they mix possible isospin states of right-handed particles. Um, so these are the, um, the various symmetries that we get in the full complexified CL8. Um, now the question, uh, and so algebraically, you can see that they come in these pairs. Um, so this is what we found for the complex CL8 case. And so the question is now, well, what happens when we restrict down to CL08? Well, when we restrict down to CL08, we shave off half the degrees of freedom. Um, in the process, we lose um, half of our Lie algebras and half of our Jordan algebras on the diagonals. Um, in other words, we now have only an SU3 plus U2 plus another U2 algebra, Lie algebra, and then we've got another uh, Jordan algebra that's analogous to those. So one way to interpret the situation is to look at these six types of transformation and to characterize half of them as Lie algebraic and the other as Jordan algebraic. Well, how are we going to identify which correspond to Lie algebras and which correspond to Jordan algebras? One obvious identification is to notice that half of these transformations describe internal symmetries. So namely SU3 color, SU2 left, and SU2 right. So we might identify these with Lie algebras. And the other transformations describe mass and spin. So we might identify these as Jordan algebraic. 
So address, to, to address this final item in our wish list, um, the octonionic substructure of our CL8 uh, uh, does supply us with a natural way to identify certain symmetries and observables that, we, that are familiar in particle physics. For better or for worse though, um, the details are close to, but not exactly the same as what we see in the standard model. Okay, so now that we have these Lie algebras and Jordan algebras in hand, we would like to, to go after the last two items in our wish list, namely, uh, do the standard model representations fit into these octonionic purse blocks? And can we find a simple action that's going to make this happen? Well, in an attempt to keep things simple, a first guess at an action might look like this. Um, where the B and the V are defined at the complexified level, and then we add a complex conjugate in order to have the output that lives in the real CL08 slice. So this is an interesting avenue to explore because it appears to be the simplest possible action. Um, but it does not give us the particle content that we want, um, at least at known energies. And that is, it's going to give us the same structure that we see in supersymmetric theories. Um, where we have an equal number of bosons to fermions. The standard model, though, as you may have noticed, has more fermionic degrees of freedom than it does bosonic degrees of freedom. So when we use this action, um, we don't get three linearly independent generations, but rather two. And we end up instead with extra leptoquarks and Higgs bosons. Um, so this action might be troubled from an experimental perspective, at least at the energies that we're interested in. Now, one might argue that this action is troubled as well from um, a perspective of aesthetics. Um, that is, the octonions have, gave us the second pair of projection operators for free. And as you can see, this action is really only making use of one of those pairs, the little s projectors. So in order to, um, that, that is in order to separate out fermions and bosons. So said another way, we can um, see that there's a more refined Z2 grading here that, um, that our action can use um, so as to separate fermions and bosons. So in this case, we're going, if we, if we obey this Z2 structure, then we're going to end up with more fermions and bosons, and perhaps if we're lucky, um, even three linearly independent generations. Well, here is um, one such action on these off diagonals that will define fermions and bosons with respect to this more refined Z2 grading. Here are the projection operators P plus and P minus take into account this time the octonionic imaginary unit coming from both the left and the right. Now, in order to satisfy the fact that, the, that this is a real slice, um, we perform our action on a set of carefully chosen representative objects in the complex CL8. And then we add in the complex conjugate at the end, which ensures that we're living in the real CL08 slice. So now we're ready to answer the following questions. Do the particle representations of the standard model fit into these octonionic purse blocks? And using this action, do they transform in a way that is consistent with the particle physics that we know? Well, first, let's start with three generations of left-handed quarks. As a vector space, it so happens that they fit perfectly into, these, um, into this subspace in green. Now, under this action, we find that these dark green blocks do indeed transform as left-handed quarks. Next, we find that left-handed leptons um, fit perfectly as vector spaces into this subspace. And furthermore, under our action, these light green blocks do transform as left-handed leptons. Finally, these uh, th uh, three generations of right-handed quarks fits perfectly into these dark blue subspaces and they transform as do right-handed quarks. So now we're at the point where we've covered almost all of the off diagonal blocks and the only fermions that we have left to embed are the right-handed uh, leptons. And we find that this last off diagonal block, um, the last off diagonal blocks do transform as right-handed leptons, but they only give us one generation, not three. So we're missing an embedding for two generations of right-handed leptons. 
Okay, so let's leave those remaining fermions for now and move on to the bosons. Next, we find an object that is expected to eventually transform as a lepton's form momentum. This was not part of the standard model's um, uh, particle content that we listed earlier, but it does appear within the momentum space representation of a standard model's covariant derivative, so it could be relevant for us. Now, in the next block, we find a similar form momentum for quarks, together with a further with further representations transforming under the SU3 adjoint. Um, so in the context of a gauge theory, these are expected to transform as do a full set of gluons. Now, in this bottom uh, diagonal block, we have elements transforming under the SU2 left adjoint. And so in the context of a gauge theory, we would expect that these degrees of freedom to correspond to electroweak um, gauge bosons. Although we in fact have too many of these representations here this time. So if we were to stop now, we see that we have uh, 232 real degrees of freedom uh, behaving uh, in accordance with the standard model under the group SU3 cross SU2 cross U1 over Z6. Um, so this is a majority of the 252 that we would need for the standard model if we were to include momentum operators and three generations of right-handed neutrinos. So when I say majority, I mean to say that we're at 92%. Furthermore, we can see some desired patterns emerge. In particular, we can um, notice that the bosonic objects like four momenta and gauge bosons live in the diagonal blocks colored here in orange. In fact, those extra uh, four momentum blocks seem to be important because now the diagonal blocks appear to be describing a momentum space version of a covariant derivative. Um, if we look at the off diagonal blocks, um, this is where the fermionic degrees of freedom are found. Now we're still missing two generations um, of right-handed leptons. Yet on the other hand, we seem to have too many elements transforming as do electroweak bosons. So could there be a natural way to alleviate this tension? What I will point out is that these subspaces were based on one particular octonionic imaginary unit, as you'll remember, E7. However, if we finally introduce to this electroweak sector another octonionic imaginary unit, orthogonal to the first, then it can act to further split this electroweak block. The introduction of a second octonionic imaginary unit is something that we could anticipate uh, because we expect this choice of octonionic imaginary unit to vary from point to point over what will be an emergent spacetime manifold. Oddly enough, uh, when we do this, the diagonal block um, now provides us with a suitable, uh, a suitable space for these electroweak gauge bosons. So now it fits the electroweak gauge bosons um, perfectly. And the off diagonals um, now have exactly the right dimension to describe the missing two generations of right-handed leptons. So if we can get this electroweak sector working in this way, we, win, we will then have covered 100% of the standard model's three generations of fermions and its gauge bosons. On the algebraic side, there would remain only eight real degrees of freedom left in the algebra. Um, an obvious possibility for these eight degrees of freedom would be two Higgs fields, one corresponding to SU2 left and the other corresponding to SU2 right. However, it's too early to say more about this at this point. Okay. In summary. So in this talk, I ventured my current best guess to the question, what is the universe made of and how does it work? Um, hence, we set out to build a model based on the smallest number of initial inputs possible. This led to the proposal of doing away with the QFT picture of fields on top of a space-time manifold. And instead, uh, we propose a single structure of directed graphs. However, we quickly found that these directed graphs are not going to provide us with enough information to be able to explain why space-time has three plus one dimensions. So from this point, we propose that these directed graphs should originate from the operations of an algebra. 
Perhaps uh, a clever choice of algebra could lead to an emergent space time that is three plus one dimensional. With this in mind, we then started looking into the algebra of the complex quaternions. Um, for one, the complex quaternions have a group of inner automorphisms given by SO31. Moreover, Conway knew back in the 1930s that most of the Lorentz representations that we now happen to use in the standard model can be described succinctly with this algebra. We then showed that the full set of Lorentz representations of the standard model can be completed by considering um, the discrete symmetries of the algebra. From these discrete symmetries, we found that actions of C cross H on itself under which um, um, the Lorentz representations of the standard model uh, appear as stable subspaces. These generalize the notions, the notion of an ideal. Um, one might expect that uh, such generalized, generalized ideals to emerge from the algebra, given that they survive no matter which element of the algebra is applied to them. Now, at this point, we emphasize that the internal degrees of freedom of the standard model had not yet been accounted for. So we propose extending C cross H so as to include the four um, uh, finite dimensional norm division algebras over R, the Dixon algebra. However, this new RCHO algebra still has only 64 real uh, dimensions, whereas the number of off-shell degrees of freedom in the standard model, including a separate Higgs and three sterile neutrinos, adds up to 244 real degrees of freedom. But nature then supplied us with a route, um, a route out of this dilemma, namely that we can consider sequences of RCHO elements multiplying RCHO elements. The multiplication algebra gives us an incarnation of the complex Clifford algebra CL10. And curiously enough, the CL10 may be factorized into CL08 and complex CL2, which are the complex Clifford algebras familiar from real and complex bot periodicity. If we're lucky, this might give us a route into something that John Bias and others call the tenfold way. Now, from this factorization, uh, we proposed that a, a single we propose an algebraic starting point for what might emerge as a three-dimensional space corresponding to CL30 and a standard model fiber, fiber corresponding to 08, CL08. We then emphasize the perspective that CL08 is worth paying attention to because it is an unavoidable structure in the world of real Clifford algebras. We then pointed out how it may lead to a natural incarnation of a Fox space for standard model states. From here, we set out to concretely embed the standard model's off-shell degrees of freedom into a CL08 that is generated by the division algebras. We made use of a single octonionic imaginary unit to partition complex CL8 into blocks. And restricted within these diagonal blocks, we found Lie algebras and Jordan algebras corresponding to elements of a rudimentary um, covariant derivative. We furthermore restricted these algebras by forbidding quaternions to transform into octonions within the blocks. And then we took, um, a, then we took a, the uh, CL0, a real CL08 slice, and this left us with an SU3 plus U2 plus U2 Lie algebra and a corresponding Jordan algebra. Um, now, when acting on fermionic space, we find that these Lie algebras and Jordan algebras, they seem to come in these pairs. Um, and this causes the fermions to exhibit what we call multiplet mirroring, namely an algebraic correspondence between three colors and three generations, between quark helicity and isospin left, between lepton helicity and isospin right. And then we, we then identified a relatively simple action that respects um, a Z2 grading with bosons on the diagonals and fermions on the off diagonals. And when restricting this action down to the standard models Lie algebra, we found that 92% um, of expected states transforming under these symmetries in agreement with the standard model. We then pointed out that it may be possible to pick up the last 8% if the electroweak sector breaks. Um, such a breaking might be affected by a second octonionic imaginary unit that is orthogonal to the first. There are eight real degrees of freedom left over in this CL08. Um, it may be um, possible to associate these with a left-handed Higgs and a right-handed Higgs. However, these details are beyond the scope of this talk. And that's all I have to say.
Okay, great. Thank you. Well, I think that's a historic lecture. I'm <laughs> glad it's been recorded. We will visit it again and again. Also, because I think it has quite a few things which are not yet written down. So very exciting. Thanks so much, Cole. Thank um, you. Yeah, and can, can I just say, Cole, thank you for that was an absolutely surpassingly clear overview. I, I've rarely if ever heard I mean, such a, a wonderfully clear and at the same time, you know, dense exposition of so, so much new material um, laid out thank so clearly. You. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I appreciate, appreciate it. So the talk is open for questions. Kindly use the raise hand feature. So uh, as questions come in, Kona, I just wanted to mention, I think it's very good if you have two Higgs. It's like predicting uh, one more Higgs, which I think is very good. I wouldn't be daunted by the fact that we are just seeing one right now and that uh, you are predicting one too many. I think that's a good thing. So I hope we get that across to particle physicists. So Vatsalya, uh, let me please, uh, uh, please unmute yourself. Uh, hi, um, it was a very nice talk. Thank you for the talk. Um, Thank you. Uh, I, I have three questions. Um, like if you could go, go to the slide where you have the, uh, the, the table of all the representations. Um, okay. Uh, so let's say this. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So here you have a uh, P mu, which is a space time vector, and uh, like mm -hmm. it does not transform under internal gate symmetries. So uh, do like is, is is the interpretation that P mu provides us like vectors in space time? Is, uh, like, so um, yeah. emerges out of uh, this representation. That's a good question. So the only, um, I wasn't dealing at all with um, space-time symmetries um, yet at this point. So the only um, symmetries that I um, was analyzing this under um, was the um, the SU3 cross SU2 cross U1 symmetry. So uh, the gauge, gauge symmetries. Um, and so under that, then these are just singlets. And so that's consistent with, with what we would expect. Um, it, it will be another step in order to get um, space-time symmetries into this model, and I, I expect it to be non-trivial. Uh, an, an, another question I have is, like, from this model, it seems that the three generations of fermions, they are uh, absolutely identical. Um, is there any way to differentiate between them? Because we know that one generation is, is much more stable than the other two. That's a yeah I, I, again a really good question. So actually, this one of the things that um, that I like about this model is that the the three generations are not showing up as identical. So um, the left handed the the left handed ones um, are so this is also something that um, I've so this is a, a good point that you're making. Um, it would be nice if um, in our particle models that somehow the three generations come have they come up. Um, they, they're, they emerge as being algebraically different from each other so that you can, so that they can have different properties. Um, and um, in this, uh, so in this model, the, the three generations do come up as different from each other. They're, um, it's, they're kind of scattered over the off diagonals. The only um, symmetry there are here between the three generations are the left-handed ones. Um, they seem to be exact copies of each other, but the right-handed ones, um, they're kind of dispersed in different places in the off diagonals. Um, so if there is a difference, I would expect it to come from that. Thank you. Uh, and you okay. had a third question. Uh, we go, John, please go ahead. Hi, Carl. Thanks very much. Um, yep. Do I understand you from somebody fairly new to this? Do I understand that you're suggesting the imaginary units in the octonians are somehow Higgs fields. And if that's the right picture, how does that relate to the Higgs that we know already? Or is so that- can you, uh, can you, I didn't hear the beginning of your question. Can you repeat it? Yeah, so I think you're suggesting that these um, imaginary units in the octonians are somehow Higgs fields. Is that is that what uh, you're suggesting? And if so, how, uh, how do they relate to the Higgs that we already know about? Right. So I. I wouldn't say that the way that they're appearing here is um, is as the octonionic imaginary units. Um, so the the octonionic imaginary units gave us or it gave us these blocks, but I wouldn't have identified. 
identified it as the Higgs, um, the way that they, so if the, so the, this is still to be worked out because the, the electroweak part is, is the, the part that is um, still needs some steps in order to be completed. But the way that it's looking right now, the extra degrees of freedom that are not yet accounted for actually um, live in the SU2 left adjoint and the SU2 right adjoint. So if they were to be Higgs, they, they wouldn't be, um, at least at first sight, they don't look like they would be um, the same as the Higgs that we have in the standard model. Um, it, it's just a different, uh, a different representation. There, they would have to be, I'm not exactly sure how this should work out. Um, yet. I, I think in order to get um, the electroweak part to kind of break in the way that I would like it to, I think this um, we need to really uh, move beyond just looking at the representations um, of this algebra and rather like actually turn this into a gauge theory and um, have this, um, this octonionic E7 vary from point to point and see what happens. Okay, thanks. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Davian, please unmute yourself, go ahead. So I just wanna follow up on your answer there, Cole. Did I hear you say that your extra degrees of freedom correspond to two adjoint SU2s? That's what it, it, that's what it looks like at first sight, but of course there's going, to, I can see already that there's gonna be more like once this is built as a gauge theory, there's going to be more details about how this, um, these uh, electroweak bosons are going to um, kind of break, um, kind of emerge from these bottom blocks. And again, just following up, are those the only adjoint degrees of freedom that are showing up here? Um, well, there's, uh, so there's gluons in the, um, in the, in, a couple things to say, but there's gluons in the top blocks that are the adjoint under SU3. Um, so the gluons are in there and there's, um, and the W, uh, the uh, electroweak bosons in the bottom block. Um, one thing I should mention is that it looks like there's, um, uh, that the electroweak are, are kind of entirely in the bottom block and the, and the gluons are, are in the top half space. But actually when you take the real slice, um, there's a symmetrization that happens and, there's, and they kind of end up being spread over both. So this looks like it's um, asymmetric um, across, uh, across that axis, but it, actually it's not as um, asymmetric and as ad hoc as it might look at first sight. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Yeah, no problem. Great. David, go ahead, please. Well, thanks for the excellent talk. So I just had a question about potentially getting a graviton in the C cross H cross O model. So uh, as we know, a, a, two, a spin two graviton is a, would be a tensor product of two vectors. So I, I was curious, do you think when we take that tensor product and we're working with C cross H, would it be a tensor product over complex numbers such that we get C cross H cross H? Um, I, I, that was just an idea I had when I was looking at this a while ago, but I, I didn't uh, finish looking into it. I was just curious if you had any thoughts. That's also a good question. So I, this is something that I'm just starting to look into. And there was, so there's different, there's different ways to go about this project. And the first way that, or one of the ways that we've spent a lot of time looking at it was you start with the complex seal eight and um, there's there's kind of two obvious routes. You can go the CL08 route, which I like because of the, um, the because of its connection to bot periodicity. But then you can there's also um, a Jordan algebraic route where you you look at the Hermitian uh, real slice, which is a different real slice. Um, now in in that kind of line of thinking, there's actually a really natural way, or what what looks to me like it could be a natural way to, to build um, a Fearbine and then actually that this whole thing might be interpreted as a generalized Fearbine. Um, and so you might be able to just kind of build everything off of that. Um, so that's actually what I looks to me to be kind of like the easiest route to try to get to bring gravity in. Um, this bot period, this other real slice that I'm presenting today is new to me. Um, and so I'm not exactly, I haven't thought about it long enough about how exactly um, to bring gravity in, except for the fact that you can notice that the complex CL2 might be reinterpreted as a CL3-0, and maybe this, this could give 
space sometime, but uh, somehow, but um, it's not as obvious to me in this case, like how, how you would go about uh, bringing gravity in. Uh, can, I, can I respond to that, Cole? You seem to be having an extra SU2, if I understood you correctly. Um, the SU2, me, right? For me, that's gravity, actually, you know. You have SU2L and SU2R. This is what we have been elaborating in our papers. I mean, your gravity is sort of hiding in plain sight because- Do, you know, um, uh, did, Does it, will it? Hmm. Will it will it affect all particles? Like, will it will it act on like gauge bosons, for example, or like will you? Uh, uh, the the thing is that uh, so I have essentially something like two copies of CL eight, uh, direct which is CL nine thought of as a direct sum of two copies of CL eight, one okay. that corresponds to left-handed chiral fermions, the other to the right-handed chiral fermions. The two Higgs, I have two Higgs like you have. The standard model Higgs is uh, giving mass to the left-handed particles. The second Higgs is essentially giving electric charge to the right-handed uh, particles. So gravity has a symmetric uh, role of course, I come with extras. I don't just get gravity, general relativity. I have a mirror copy of the standard models, SU2, SU3 color, cross SU2L, cross U1 uh, electromagnetic or hypercharge has a copy SU3 grav, cross SU2R, which is general relativity, and a U, cross a U1 grav. Is your, so, like, do you, does the Higgs end up coupling left-handed particles to right-handed particles in your model? Yes, 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 yes. Okay. The, the, the two, the two, the, that's why the two, it's important to have the second uh, Higgs. And uh, it seems in several ways that the extras that you are seeing, which uh, we are trying to accommodate, Mm -hmm. would fit in nicely if already at this stage we start taking care of gravity along with the standard model instead of leaving that for later. So my, my naive guess is that the, you're almost there, you're almost there, but to exactly get from 92% to 100%, now is the time to, you know, uh, bring in gravity right away. And that is where things seem to start falling into place. And uh, so uh, that's why I wanted to ask you, have you looked at having two copies of CL8? Uh, uh, um, so the, that, that would give me 512. For me, that's good okay. because very close to E8 cross E8, 496. And, but then you, uh, um, don't you then have a doubling of the number of degrees of freedom? I mean, I have, uh, you're saying I have too many, I have too many. No, uh, one CL8 go for the left-handed particles, which are singlets of SU2R, the other CL8 for right-handed particles, which are singlets of SU2L. The gravity is the right-handed counterpart of the weak force. Somehow that comes in very strongly. Hmm. Yes, I haven't thought about uh, using the, the SU2 rate for, for gravity. Um, you know, if you remember Peter White's paper on Euclidean twister quantization, he mm -hmm. says the same thing that, you know, SU2R is adequate for constructing general relativity. Oh, he did have something. He was also using Ashtakar. Yes, yes. I I to, I to... I'm saying the same thing, except that that is Euclidean, and that's something we have to worry about, Euclidean versus Lorentzian. But we, we can come to that. I don't think that's necessarily insurmountable. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, like, you know, when you break the electroweak sector, for me, the counterpart of the electroweak sector is SU2R, Cross what I call a U, another U1, 
which I call U1 graph. So there are additional predictions, but you know, I wouldn't say they are not there. I maybe uh, we have to think what is SU3 graph doing. U1 graph is very much behaving like Mond. So for me, there's no there's no mysterious dark matter. It is really you know modified the Newtonian dynamics on uh, larger galactic scales and. Uh, uh, somehow that seems to go well. I think, sorry, I think hands are up. I should, uh, Jens, okay. please go unmute yourself. Thanks, Cole. Thanks for the yeah. response. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, my, my pleasure. Hey, yeah. So yeah, thanks. Uh, great, great talk. Thanks for the rundown and uh, and, and everything. So uh, cool. So I have to follow up on that, uh, breaking the electroweak sector with an additional octonionic Face that's that's cool. Um, just a very quick re remark at the very beginning. You you mentioned the uh, current uh, uh, investigation in that field. I, and I'll just add, and maybe you said it uh, that Gursey and Gunaidin also worked on the exceptional Jordan algebra for this kind of oh. things. And I mean, it's okay. it's contained in at least one or two of those references that you had. And uh, but again, yeah, it's okay. points again back all the way into the 1970s. So they've been working on yeah. that cool stuff. Were they, um, was, did they, um, was it a three generation uh, project that they were working on? I, I would have to dig up the details and I'm now I'm actually curious about digging up the details. They didn't just yeah. do the uh, exceptional Jordan algebra, they also did other variations of on top of Jordan algebra. So anyway, but next to their SU3, uh, you know, uh, uh, algebraic yeah. uh, 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 strong force. Anyway. Just yep. wanted to 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 add that here, yeah. and they they also use uh, Pierce decomposition then on on the exceptional Jordan algebra to isolate where they think. But you know, I mean, okay. so yeah. it's just amazing. I imagine it as, probably as was a it, it probably was a three. I imagine it probably was a three generation effort because okay. like well, if you've got the exceptional Jordan algebra, why wouldn't you why wouldn't you go for three generations? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It okay. it, yeah, it, it can't have yeah, been the. Yeah, yeah. I haven't yeah. seen those papers, but I'd be curious to I'd be curious to see them. I'll I'll find it. Um, I think you're the person actually that that you were the person that introduced me to uh, Grunetti and Garcia in the in the first place anyway. So yeah, that <laughs> so was they, cool. Thirteen they, years ago. They owe, they owe you. That you're their, their <laughs> best advocate. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. Uh, Jeffrey is on the call here too, so uh, don't forget him. <laughs> Oh, Unless, I said you're 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 their best advocate. I said that you're oh. that that you that you like uh, you advocate for them. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you, David Jackson. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks, Tajinda, and uh, thanks, Carl, very much for the talk. I, I like very much the talk and uh, the introduction, particularly. Um, so, so you mentioned um, going beyond um, space time, and you went via directed graphs, and then that originating from algebras and then motivating a particular algebra leading to the standard model. I, I lost track of where the directed graphs come in. Was that just a kind of a stepping stone or how does it connect? I mean, I don't know anything about graph theory, but does that do with building the space time or, or where does the directed graph kind of come into it? Well, why um, not just go yeah. straight to the algebra? Oh, I see. Um... Well, the, yeah, the original idea was was basically to take something that looks like a Simon, uh, Feynman, like some over paths, but like a discretized version of that, um, just as something that could be, it started out just as like literally as a game as like, what's the what's the simplest possible thing you could imagine that could still capture some things that we see in nature. And so that's where the directed graphs idea came from. And then from there, then like I, I don't see an obvious way to explain why there's three plus one dimensions so that so making these things algebraic was was um a way that you know maybe if if this if it's um if the um uh, say for example um uh, propagation along an edge could be given by multiplication um by the algebra and uh, so that would give you, yeah, a directed edge. And then, uh, for example, like um, joining of two edges at a vertex could be given by addition. So there could, the the graphs could kind of correspond to operations in an algebra. Um, that's just one way that it, it might kind of materialize. But um, okay, I need to think about that. Yeah. So in, in terms of going beyond space time, where where does um, the kind of extended space time? How how is that? Um, get constructed. I mean, how do you get space time out of this? Yes. Yeah. I, I, so I, um, 
that's a good question. So um, I'm not, so yeah, I guess. So one thing is that these things will naturally be uh, Lorentz representations. So you kind of already have part of what you need. Um, I wouldn't necessarily go as far as Poincaré because I don't, I, uh, or I, I don't want to kind of assume like a, a whole manifold. Um, uh, but kind of building a model, like building, actually building up a model and getting, uh, getting the kind of gravity aspects of it to me seemed like the hardest part. So that's what I figured would be best to do last. The thing that seemed like the most straightforward, the, in order to kind of tackle this, um, you have to start somewhere. And the 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 idea was um, to find like do the easiest problems first, learn what you can from those parts, and then use what you learn from that to kind of inform the, yourself on what to do with the more difficult parts of the problem, like uh, getting an emergent space time or describing gravity. And so the thing that seemed to me to be the most obvious well-defined question to try to answer is, um, can you find an algebra where you reproduce the representations that we find in the standard model by just having this algebra act on itself? Um, and that's, you know, been a project that's obviously taken, you know, been working on that, on that aspect of it for a long time now. Um, but I'm now at the point where, you know, I, I need to start um, actually thinking of this now as a gauge theory and then trying seeing kind of what can be done if you if it's possible to incorporate gravity but um this is yeah something that i'm just at the point of starting to do now sure great okay that helps a lot yeah thanks very much carl thank you my pleasure thank you, thank you. so maybe if you it's, uh, i would like to respond to both david jackson and to paul because it's a very interesting point to, uh, time now to bring in space time the way I landed up with the octonions was because I was concerned with this question that uh, quantum theory depends on classical space-time, and that is not uh, good except as an approximation because the quantum superposition principle disallows the point structure of space-time that we take for granted in R4, even in quantum theory at low energies. So that is when I realized that one of the ways to get over this commutative space-time is to look at beyond real numbers, the division algebras, which have non-commutativity already built in, the quaternions and the octonions. And there's a very important hint coming from the quaternions when we look at the Dirac equation so it's worth asking, what are these gamma matrices doing that look very mysterious? Uh, to describe fermions in 4D Minkowski space-time, I cannot use Klein-Gordon, I must use the Dirac equation. Then in, I realized, I learned from Atiyah in one of his lectures, he said that the Dirac equation was actually first discovered by Hamilton, not by Dirac. Why? Because the, if you take a quaternionic space uh, uh, labeled by the four oct quaternionic directions, the gradient operator on this space is actually the Dirac operator. So when we put in gamma matrices into the Dirac operator, we are actually trading them in for quaternionic space. So my electron doesn't even live in a, Minkowski space time, it lives in a quaternionic space, and there's already a big hint. And as you rightly said, the quaternions and the accompanying SL2C are not big enough to accommodate color in the quarks. So we know do the next best thing. Instead of considering the gradient operator on the quaternionic space, I consider the gradient operator in an octonionic space. With that just turns out to be the Dirac equation in 10D space-time. Uh, no, in the quaternionic case, okay, it's four and four, or maybe four and six. And when you go to the octonions, it is uh, 10 dimensional space-time. So the because I need to remove the R4 space-time manifold from quantum theory, I want to replace it by a non-commutative manifold whose coordinates, so to say, are labeled by the octonions. That is my way of looking at 
why octonions are so important. They're important for quantum theory. And because they label space-time coordinates, the curvature of that space-time is indeed gravity as well as the standard model fiber. As you talked of, you have a fiber cross uh, for SL2C structure that's already there in the octonionic space. And the way space-time, to answer David Jackson's question, how does space-time emerge from this? In quantum theory, there is no space-time. There's just this octonionic space. When I take the classical limit, actually quantum to classical limit as in quantum theory, then there's a certain averaging process which converts quaternions to Minkowski space-time and octonions to Minkowski space-time across the fiber on which the standard model gauge fields live. I, I wanted to use this opportunity to give my picture of why I landed up with octonions and uh, how, what do they have to do with space time? So yeah. if you could get gravity in at this stage, I think we are done already. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's uh, easier said than done, I think. Maybe it's easy for you. No, it's not easy, but uh, I learned from you. I mean, I used your CL6 for one generation. And then, uh, but by the way, I wanted to ask you, when you said a second imaginary octonionic unit, orthogonal yeah. to the first one, are you not yeah. already going to split by octonions? Split by octonions. Uh... CL7, the CL7 algebra, the CL3, is split by quaternions, Cl2 plus Cl2. Cl7 is Cl6 plus Cl6. And yes, that's yeah. uh, algebra of, uh, no, like, you know, like in your in your video lectures. Uh, oh, when, I, don't, yeah, I don't think I'm using a second, I'm not using a second copy, like a, a second copy of the, like, of the space. Um, it's more that, um, so it's kind of, it's kind of you know a similar idea that we see in gauge theories where uh, things vary from point to point and so this this frame like um so if you see the um this picture on my screen here where i've got the the blocks are they're all defined by a single octonionic imaginary unit but you would expect um that along the graph or along what becomes like an emergent space time that um that e7 is allowed to vary from point to point and um, so just as you know, things vary in gauge theories, this, this kind of whole frame is allowed to, to vary. Um, and then you end up with these breaking of the blocks when basically something with one frame kind of makes contact with, um, with another object that is, uh, has got a frame of based on a different imaginary unit um, than you might expect. To, to have these these um no, but, these just to think, but it's... Why, why don't you work with the split by octonions why i emphasize that you know here we have a puzzle here why is the standard model uh you know left-handed why is it singlet under uh the right-handed fermions the answer to that is because it is uh, if you extend to include gravity you get gravity is a doublet under right-handed fermions and a singlet for left-handed fermions. And the bioctonions very naturally have that structure. CL7 and CL3 being the only two uh, algebra, Clifford algebras which have two irreps, these two pinners. Mm -hmm. And they, they are parity reversing. Yeah, I think of CL7 as two copies of CL6, a direct sum one copy for the left-handed fermions, one for the right-handed fermions, and uh, things so why would, work. Um, why would they have, um, why would one have a, uh, an SU2 symmetry and the other one not? But I guess you're saying that the, the SU2 symmetry for right is you're interpreting as gravity. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yes. So is this um, so? Just a question. So in, in your um, in your models, like, do you have one picture that um, is it all part of one big coherent picture, or do you have um, do you have kind of different models? No, I think uh, in this latest paper, when we try to derive the CKM matrix, uh, mm -hmm. we feel we are beginning to reach a coherent picture. So I'm yeah. somewhat closer to CL nine than CL ten right now. So mm -hmm. CL9, I think of as two copies of CL8, mm -hmm. 
The first copy have a branch as CL6 cross CL2. The second copy also has CL6 cross CL2. And uh, uh, yeah, something else very puzzling has opened up from here that, uh, so with one CL2, I associate weak isospin, the other CL2 uh, with the Lorentz space and then gravity. It seems as if the weak isospin is coming with its own copy of a 4D space time. So it's like, as if there's a, CL3 giving us 6D space time before a left right symmetry breaking. And the left mm -hmm. right symmetry breaking is giving me two copies of 4D space time, which seem to be different as, as if just as gravity is the curvature of our 4D space time, the weak force is the geometry of the other 4D space time. So, weak force looking more like a space time symmetry than uh, internal do you symmetry. see um do you see any reason why um so like with the internal symmetries we end up with unitary symmetries whereas the space-time symmetries um are not uh, do you do you, do you find any uh explanations as to why is it like why, why gravity be su 2 r why should it be a gauge theory uh no just a, like with so with the um this is something that keeps me up at night is like, why do internal symmetries, uh, we get these unitary symmetries, uh, whereas space-time symmetries are, um, will be, you know, like Lorenz group or like it, they, they're they from a purely algebraic point of view. Um, okay, uh, uh, the, my, my picture, my picture for that is, you know, if you know that I talk of these so-called atoms of space-time matter where the, the uh, one uh, space-time matter atom is the fermion along with all the bosonic degrees of freedom. So the, there is one copy of this non-commutative space-time, this larger space -time which contains internal symmetries for every so-called space-time matter atom. And uh, classical space-time has to be constructed after symmetry breaking. Now, I don't have a classical space-time with this uh, Lorentzian classical structure before symmetry breaking. So before symmetry breaking, gravity truly looks like a gauge theory with, you know, like, like a SU2R, uh, which might answer your question. Later on, it starts looking different in the emergent uh, classical limit. But before symmetry breaking, uh, gravity is really truly like a young male's, or you can call it pre-gravitation. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if I'm answering you, but maybe we can, you can bring, I think David has a comment. David, can you please uh, say it out? David? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, please uh, unmute yourself. Hey, uh, yeah. is this comment on what I was saying about CL8? Yeah, I mean, um, right, so CL8 does have uh, 256 dimensions and E8 has 248, so it's, it's natural to ask the question, oh, does, does E8 fit in CL8? But uh, algebraically, it, it does not. But um, I believe the chant has done some work that looks at connecting the Gossett polytope, which is the E8 root polytope, uh, to CL8. I mean, maybe uh, one point is that the E8 root lattice is in eight dimensions. Um, so, yeah, I was just mentioning that. Yeah, since the audio is not very clear, David, I'll just read out your comment. David says, I believe CL8 is connected more to the Gosset polytope in the E8 lattice than the E8 Lie algebra itself. So perhaps looking into Deshant's work in relation to CL8 and the roots of the E8 polytope could help find connections between cold story on CL8 and arbitrary models using E8 in some way. Okay, thank you. I, I keep this in mind. I, I need to understand what's being said here. Maybe I could ask you, Cole, 
where do you see E8 fitting in your story? And also the exceptional Jordan algebra. I mean, does it have some connection with CL8 in some way? Um, the, two, that's two, a two good questions. question. I probably, yeah, that's a good question for for both of them. Um, it's not something that I've uh, that I've spent a huge amount of time on with either of them. Um, I've got a long list of projects that I would like to work on, and um, they are included in that list. But uh, they're not something that I've ever kind of come around to doing. Um, but there's yeah, they, I've got kind of ideas for both that I would love to to kind of explore but I um at this point I don't have a lot to say because I haven't um I haven't spent a lot of time on them thank you so I, I, I think the general to... question I think the general question of like knowing what mathematical structure to choose is a, is a really difficult one um like no matter which mathematical structure you choose, you have to ask like, why did why would nature have chosen this thing over over something else? And yeah, but you know the way I like to come. To like I, I, I like to try to like pick ubiquitous structures, like things that are kind of unavoidable somehow. And that's why I you know I like the division algebras is that they kind of they're kind of everywhere. And that's also the motivation behind this bot periodicity stuff is that it's they're kind of every they're this unavoidable. Is very interesting. Fox space from bot periodicity. I think that's really nice idea. I definitely hadn't thought of it. I think it would be very useful. So you, regarding what you said, you know, about picking up which mathematical structure to choose, for me, what's more important is the physics question that I'm asking. That comes first, and then I go looking for a structure. So in that context, I wanted to mention, you know, how I was in, in, got interested in this mass quantization question is to note that the mass ratios of the first generation, down quark, up quark, and the electron, the mass ratios are nine is to four is to one, and the square root of masses are in the ratio three is to two is to one, whereas the electric charge ratios are one is to two is to three. For me, this is very striking. So motivated by your result that there is charge quantization, I introduced for the right-handed set to the second CL8, there is again a U1 quantum number, but for the right-handed particles, my U1 charge is not electric charge, it is square root of mass. So uh, I interchange the location of the down quark and the electron. The down quark becomes a singlet under SU3 grav, which is the right-handed sector. The electron is now a triplet under SU3 grab, but it is very useful to get in this U1 charge, which is square root of mass, because someday I need to explain why the down, up, and the uh, electron have square root mass ratios of uh, three is to two is to one. It's telling us something. I mean, if, if, if you found charge quantization your way, I would definitely do the next thing and you hence conclude that mass quantization is also from a U1 number. And then interestingly, the U1, uh, right-handed U1 square root mass number is the same for all three generations to begin with. The reason the mass ratios look different is because we make all our measurements using electric charge eigenstates when those mass eigenstates are written as superposition of electric charge eigenstates, the masses start to look funny. And even then, the first generation mass ratio always remains uh, simple. So I, I say this because I think you you are very you have almost all the same kind of structures. I realize after listening to your talk, and. Uh, I think why I would seriously considering bringing square root mass in right away as another U1 charge, uh, analogous to electric charge. Okay, so so the the thing that you're claiming is that there's um, that there there are is it the there's four is it a neutrino electron or I guess it's a electron down quarks and up quarks and it's the mass ratios. Of those so in my right-handed right sector, there are three sterile neutrinos. 
one sterile neutrino, right-handed uh, sterile neutrino, is the idempotent on which I built the right chiral fermions. And the first excitation is now not the down quark. It is the electron, which is a SU3 grab triplet. Next comes the up quark, same as in your classification. And the singlet uh, is now the down quark. The down quark and the sterile neutrino are singlets of SU3 grab, whereas the electron and the right-handed electron and the right-handed up quark are triplets of uh, SU3 grab. Okay, so the so the but the the claim I was asking is so the claim is that um, that is the, um, the the mass ratios for all four of those types of particles for the first generation. Is that right? Are they are good? Yeah. So well, the neutrino as of now seems to me to be massless. The reason for neutrino flavor oscillation is something other than mass that we can argue separately. So the mass, the square root mass ratios for the sterile neutrino, for the electron, for the up quark and the down quark, are now zero, one third, two third, one. This is the same pattern as you have for the electric charge, but I switch, deliberately switch the position of the electron and the down quark. Okay. I, I haven't seen it yet, but I, like I'll, um, I do have to, I still do have to look at it. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, David, you want to say something more? Uh, oh, C cross, O cross, O and uh, are curious. Yeah, I use C cross, O cross, O as the complex split bioctonians. Okay, please, uh, we still have time, another 10 minutes, if you have any comments. Uh, I actually, uh, we have a participant, Hilary C. Could you kindly, uh, I found what you're saying would look very interesting. Uh, could you kindly come up and say what you're saying? Um, I'm not sure it's actually as interesting as you seem to think it is. Um, I just speculated that maybe there are two Higgs, but if we can't tell them apart, we will be none the wiser. Yeah, oh, um, but these would have two different, one would be um, under, uh, would, would transform under SU2 left and the other one under SU2 right. So okay. They, they would, um, and yeah, they would be different, yeah. And by, okay. by the way, for me, the one of the Higgs is charged. Well, the the new Higgs, the non-standard model Higgs, is actually electrically charged. I think particle physicists have to say something about it. Right, because I mean, I was wondering, you know, you can have something that, in terms of the structure, is a different, separate thing. But if there's no procedure or measurement that you could define that you could do in an accelerator that would allow you to tell them apart, mm. then it wouldn't show up in the data. But from what people are saying, this would be detectable if you got left versus right, or, I mean, if it's charged, it would stick out like a sore thumb, surely. I mean, unless it's very, very massive, I suppose, but um, I mean, Higgs is heavy. Maybe the other one is even heavier. I don't know. I mean, I'm a quantum information theorist, okay? So one other useful is, lesson that I saw in this algebra studies, for me at least the Higgs is composite, most certainly so. It seems to be made of the very fermions to which it is supposed to give masses. Cole, have you seen something like compositeness of the Higgs? Yeah, I, yeah, I know that there's composite Higgs models out there, but um, yeah, again, it's it's not something I've spent a lot of time on, different Higgs models. Jens has the question. Is there a hand up? Yes, yes, Jens, please. Let me uh, please unmute yourself. Yeah. Okay. Emma, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah uh, just to want to quickly. So, um, with mass, and uh, so in conventional physics today, we uh, think of uh, energy momentum properties uh, as quadratic forms or quadratic 
types to be conserved between equivalent frames of reference. So when you talk about square roots of mass, so does that mean that you're looking at fourth order conserved properties between equivalent frames of reference? Seems so, seems so, mm -hmm. yes. Also, interestingly, the square root of mass comes with both signs. Mass is positive, but when I take the square root, it has plus minus square root m. And my understanding is that's how I would define matter versus antimatter. Mm -hmm. uh, matter has square root m positive, antimatter has square root m negative. It was always puzzling for me that when I call something as matter particles, it has positively charged particles like the, uh, you know, the down quark and the up quark, and it has negatively charged particles like the electron. So clearly the sign of the electric charge is not a dynamical variable which discriminates matter from antimatter. Sure. Whereas the, so, um, the sign as, of square root uh, mass hmm. very nicely, you know, tells me. So, right. Yeah. So, so, so I'm certainly sy sympathetic to uh, exploring in that direction. I just want to point out that today a lot of people find spinners useful for the description of nature, and uh, they require only quadratic uh, conserved properties. Yeah, okay. So, uh, to, uh, if you're yeah, saying then, that we yeah. we have to look at something other than spinners for fundamental particles, that's a that's a big that's so, big ask. Uh, well, two ways to of looking at it. Firstly, the square root of mass. The little I know about supersymmetry makes way. I mean, it comes there to right because you the square of the supersymmetry operator is what gives you the space time operator or the Dirac operator. So already, in some sense, there's a hint of a square root mass there, and uh, yeah, yeah. And the way, to my understanding, say Cole makes spinners is the octonionic algebra acts on itself. So again, uh, I would think that, you know, you're quadratic or bilinear in the octonion if you want to make a spinner. And if I associate mass with the Dirac spinner, I have to then talk of square root mass at the octonion level. Square root M into root M to get an M for the spinner. That, that that's how I am inclined to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So about. so the way I understood it, you when you when you pointed out this here, the, the real CO two for for gravity, you are understanding it in this sense. And then uh, you know I think as mathematical implementation, not spinners anymore, but fourth order conserved properties. And con yes, conversely, yes. if you want to stay with spinners, then I think calls concern is like, well, what does this real CO2 tool do like, yeah, yeah, else yeah, yeah. in your representation? Look at this very interesting thing that the klein gordon equation is quadratic in mass m squared, but the source term for Einstein equation is linear in the mass. It's very striking, sure. right? The, the energy moment tells is not m squared, it's m. Mm -hmm. And that again seems to tie up with, you know, uh, that is, it's like uh, taking an underlying theory with square root m, squaring it, and then arriving at uh, yeah. gravity. Maybe. Yeah. You don't have to con convince me about this path at all. <laughs> so yeah, uh, thank, thank you. you. I, I appreciate you talking about it. Thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. I think David, uh, I'll read out his comment. Krasnow and a collaborator looked at obtaining fermionic Lagrangians from Klein Gordon. With the first order constraint, the fields obtained there seem uh, to be a field redefinition from standard ones by square root m. Okay, thanks. You're using not sure. I'll, I'll try to see this paper long ago, 2012. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Cole, you would like to add something? You could finish in time. That was nice. Yes. Oh, yeah, just barely. I think it was only five minutes over, so it was uh, not as nearly as bad as I expected. Um, no, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody for showing up um, and, you know, for your questions. It's, yeah, this has so far been a really friendly conference. And um, So yeah, how, how do you make contact with quantum field theory? I mean, if you want to work with octonions and quantum field theory, how would you go about it? 
Mm. Um, that's a good question. Cause I, you know, would really like to start from this, like the, from this really rudimentary um, picture of um, algebraic operations mm -hmm. uh, and to kind of come up with something that resembles quantum field theory and no limit is um, obviously not trivial, but um, I do, like I do have ideas for, you know, there's a lot of things that, you know, kind of need to be constructed um, when you're starting with such basic objects. Um, and yeah, I certainly do have ideas about that. But, uh, you know, again, this is kind of right at the point. This is kind of where I'm at in my research right now is to start to. Yeah, so maybe I take this opportunity to ask Professor Steve Adler, if you are there, Steve, I had a question for you. Steve, are you there? But Steve's not there yet. Because he has looked a lot at quaternionic quantum mechanics. He has a book on it. Mm. So I wanted to ask what he thought of the extension to octonions, but I think I, I'm not sure he's there right now. Yeah, there is, yeah. David also made a comment in the in the uh, chat and uh, just about a paper that uh, me and I uh, wrote uh, for one generation that um, that you. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so there, there is a connection there to to QFT. Um, so it's possible, like it, it is possible. There's kind of an obvious thing that we can do, which is um, is that you know the octonions or like the the division algebras algebras acting on themselves are you know going to give you uh, group representations, and so you can you know you can build a QFT and just use that algebraic structure to replace the representations that we use in the standard model. So that's certainly something that can be done, but um, yeah, so I think I you kind of like on a, on a bigger level, like what I, you know, what I'd really love to do is start from something really super simple and, um, and then you kind of- in, you know, Earlier on in your talk, you referred to this sociological pushback against yeah. division. I think part of the resistance, which I also was told, is uh, what can you calculate from for quantum field theory? Like, can you, for example, tell what's the G, what's the G minus two of the muon? Do you get a result different from the standard model? So those kind of questions, maybe the reason uh, that is we we are not doing dynamics yet. We are still looking at the algebraic structure of the standard model. But uh, if they are interested in questions like, uh, you know, calculate something like QFT does. Um, sure, if there, well, if there is some prediction, if there's some, uh, you know, prediction that, um, made, you, even if you could, yeah, there's a, there'd be a couple ways to, to go about it. Um, yeah, there's a lot to say. Uh, about that, um, kind of what sociological and, um, but yeah, if somebody had a had a huge breakthrough, um, you know, where they predicted something that uh, is not known from the standard model, then then that you know that would certainly that change. Would, the story, wouldn't it? I, I that's where I would push for calculating values of the fundamental counts. That's one thing they cannot do, and one thing which we may have opportunity for, in my opinion. Um, uh, uh, so yes, Michael. Uh, yes, thanks very much, Tajinda. Um, I, I really hesitate to put this question because I have virtually no background in particle physics at all, uh, and I, the only thing I can bring to the table is is a general interest in the particularly the framework of bot, of bot periodicity from from the framework really for kind of purely mathematical study of of Clifford algebras. Um, but on this uh, certainly very fundamental question of how one brings in some notion of an emergent space-time structure, uh, which, which also, I mean, clearly goes to this criticism that has been made by some of the people pushing back that at the moment you're, as it were, so far the program has really only addressed the, the algebraic structure of the standard model. It hasn't, as it were, gone into issues about dynamics, and, and clearly one would have to go into those issues about dynamics in any um in any development which did bring in space-time algebras uh the space-time 